Well, now that we've gone at breathtaking speed through a history of Egypt, welcome to your first lecture on Egyptian art. In your readings, I had you begin with The Last Judgment of Hunifer from the Book of the Dead, since it provides such a good introduction to Egyptian religion. But in my lectures, I'm beginning with our old friend, the Palette of Narmer, since it is the oldest Egyptian work we will study, and in fact, if you look at the College Board list, it is the second oldest ancient Mediterranean work. Only the White Temple at Uruk is older. This gives you a better idea of the size of this work and some evidence of my trip to Egypt in 2017. Sorry, you're going to see some more McConnell family photos over the next few days because I simply couldn't resist. Anyway, the content of this artifact has generated a lot of controversy. Maybe it commemorates the unification of Egypt after an actual battle. Maybe it presents a mythical account of unification, and maybe, these seem to be the most recent theories, it symbolizes the daily journey of the sun god Ray and or the balance between order and chaos that lie at the heart of Egyptian religion. The pharaoh, of course, stands for order, his defeated enemies for disorder. Do you remember the name for the concept of divine order and justice of a world that's operating properly? It's ma'at. That's an important concept to understand and probably an important word to remember. We'll get back to content, but first, what was the work's function? Actually, that's also a tricky question. Palettes such as this were used to mix the eyeliner or coal that Egyptians used not only to beautify themselves, but also to protect their eyes from the harsh sun. You see this illustrated on the ceramic tile on the upper right. But the palette was found at an elaborate temple and gravesite in Hierakonopolis, the capital of pre-dynastic Egypt. It's also about two feet high, which seems a little large for a makeup compact. So this palette was probably a ceremonial copy of an everyday object, maybe designed to ensure that the person buried did not burn his or her eyes in the afterlife. So let's move on to form. What sculptural technique is used here? The palette is carved in low or ba relief. Note that the victory stele is also carved in ba relief, but not quite as ba or low. See how much more shadow the figures cast. What stylistic techniques do we see here that also show up in other Near Eastern works? Well, most of the items on this list should be familiar by now. The palette does add a gruesome detail to the defeated enemy. Their severed heads and penises are placed between their legs. The pharaoh's face is in profile, but his eyes face forward. His shoulder are frontal, but below the waist he is shown in profile. This becomes the convention for portraying pharaohs. The iconography, or use of symbols to convey a message in a narrative, is much more complex than what we saw in the victory stele. It seems to be more disputed as well. But let's start with a very basic question. What are two general ways that the palette reinforces the pharaoh's power and authority, his right to rule? Note I'm not looking at this point for specific symbols. I'm looking for the two big messages that the palette sends. Well, first, there is the religious justification for the pharaoh's power and authority. King Narmer demonstrates his piety. He appeals to the gods for protection, yet he also becomes the instrument of that protection. The gods work through King Narmer to protect Egypt. And finally, he shares identity with the gods themselves. But there's a second justification for his power and authority displayed on this work. Let's get practical here. This guy knows how to win wars. He even manages to unite the two kingdoms of Egypt. Note that the victory stele of Naram Sin sends essentially the same two big messages. Now let's run through some of the iconography, starting with what is sometimes called the smiting side. What do we see inside the red circle? King Narmer is wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. Note, too, the king's well-developed musculature and wide stance. Again, this conveys dominance and victory. Remember, we saw the same heroic body type on Naram Sin. The pharaoh is also wearing a false beard. Pharaohs always do, even as we'll soon see a female pharaoh. So what's inside the green circle? We see the falcon god Horus using a human arm to take a head with a papyrus plant captive. What does that plant probably symbolize? Lower Egypt. 
Note the underlying message about the Pharaoh in the Egyptian religion Horus, son of Osiris, is identified with the living Pharaoh. The dead Pharaoh joins with Osiris in the afterlife. So both Narmer and Horus conquered Lower Egypt. Or are they one and the same? What's inside the orange circle? It's probably a goddess, either Bat or Hathor, who was the divine mother of the pharaoh. But some scholars think it may be a bull, another symbol of the pharaoh's strength and virility. Now let's turn to the side that includes the depression for eye makeup. We see the red circled hieroglyph on both sides. It's made up of a catfish and a chisel. The words for catfish and chisel together sound out something like Narmer. We think this is one of the very first names to appear on an inscription. So how has the king's headdress changed? Check out the green circle. Now the king is wearing the crown of Lower Egypt, the land he allegedly conquered and joined with Upper Egypt. The yellow circle surrounds the so-called serpaparts, a kind of mythological symbol of beasts with long entwined necks. I didn't know this before, but serpaparts actually show up in other Mesopotamian art. The serpent part on the bottom left appears on a cylinder seal that was found in a rook in Sumeria. It dates from around the same time as the palette. The best guess is that the animal is a kind of lioness, again, a symbol of royalty. And finally, in the bottom register, inside the blue circle, we see a bull lowering his head and stepping on a dead and, as usual, naked enemy. Here again, the bull symbolizes strength and virility. Later Egyptian pharaohs would be called bulls of Horus. So, did you notice the little boat just above the beheaded and castrated enemies? Boats feature prominently in Egyptian religion and art, not surprising in a culture dominated by the Nile. Boats convey the dead to the afterlife. The model you see in the middle right was found in a tomb. It was put there to make sure the mummy got where he needed to go. Boats also represented the journey of the sun across the sky. In the tomb painting on the bottom left, we see the sun god Ray, like Horus, depicted as a falcon. The artist helpfully painted a sun on top to help us keep them straight. Ray is holding an Ankh, which is the Egyptian symbol for eternal life. By the time the tomb painting was made, Horus and Ray had merged into essentially the same god. So this offers some support for another theory about the palette's iconography, that it associates Narmer's victory with the journey of the sun god Ray, bringing light and hope to Egypt. So we won't usually have the luxury of focusing on just two works in a day. I'm lingering over these two images, created, by the way, 1700 years apart, because together they introduce so many important elements and concepts of Egyptian art. So where were both of these works found? They were both found in tombs. And by the way, that is almost always the answer for Egyptian works that aren't buildings. But stop and think for a moment about the extraordinary implications for the function of these works. This art was not meant to be seen by living human beings. That's true of many of the works we'll study in this course, but it really challenges our Western concept of art. We aren't sure if the palette of King Narmer was intended to help a dead Egyptian go to the afterlife or to help him live well there when he got there. Maybe both, but almost certainly one or the other. We know a lot more about the books of the dead. Actually, the Egyptian title is better translated as Book of Coming Forth by Day. In other words, this isn't really about dying. It's about coming back to life. More specifically, it's about how to make sure that rebirth happens and happens the right way. So it's really a book of spells, the sort of book that Harry Potter and his friends have studied at Hogwarts, maybe in Charms class, maybe in my personal favorite, Defense Against the Dark Arts, AKA History. So here is spell 125, the very act that's portrayed on the Last Judgment of Hunifer and on a page from another book of the dead that was shown in the bottom right. Wealthy and important people like Hunifer would have had their own book of the dead made, but we know from archaeological finds that more ordinary people could buy such books ready-made with blanks left where they could fill in their own names. You saw this on the Khan Academy video, but just to review, the first funerary texts were only written for pharaohs and they were carved into the walls of tombs. By the Middle Kingdom, wealthy upper-class individuals could get instructions for traveling to the afterlife safely, and these were carved or painted onto coffins. This is an earlier section of Hunifer's scroll. 
Here we see the mummy of Hunifer supported by the god Anubis. Hunifer's wife and daughter are mourning his death and three priests are performing rituals. The calf at the bottom just had his head leg cut off and is about to be sacrificed. Note the cutting tools on the right, and it's no wonder that the mama cow looks a little dismayed. I am not going to retell this story. I'm going to let the class do it. Remember that the story reads from left to right. I'm also going to do you a favor and tell you that this image, circles and all, is going to show up in a matching quiz. Next class, fill in those workbooks. By the way, the British Museum posted an excellent TED Talk on the Book of the Dead that goes through the story. We didn't assign it, believe it or not, but the link is up on Moodle. Now that we have looked at the role of the pharaoh and the centrality of the afterlife, we're going to have to move more quickly through Egyptian art, starting with the Old Kingdom sculpture and architecture.